no matter what I've ever done from going to space to anything, never, ever replace the feeling of putting on a uniform and walking out into a, a stadium. You know, it's crazy that you just said going to space. Yeah. Like, it's like wild, Like matter right? of fact, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, everybody? Today I'm sitting here with two of my dear friends, but also two incredible entrepreneurs and business partners, something that I have my own experience with. And we're not going to start with you, sir. Good. You know why? Because somebody here more important than me is here. Yeah, and, and you know that I know way too much about you probably. as a... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to start with this rock star to my left. And about three weeks ago, you came here. It was very similar, like four weeks ago, and got to learn all about your career. And rarely am I a bit like surprised at how unique someone's trajectory is because mine was, and I feel like I've heard so many of these, but yours is truly unique. I want you to first paint a picture a little bit to our audience of you know where you came from. I know it dates all the way back to the 90s, which is crazy because you're 28 years old. <clears throat> um, right? You see that? <laughs> yeah. Um, but tell us how you got here. Tell us who Constance Schwartz Marini is. Well, first, thank you for having both of us um, because normally people just want him. And when I get the emails, I'm like, forward to Mooch. And when you guys emailed and said you wanted the two of us, I was like, I knew I liked him from the beginning. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Michael. Um, what? You what? can talk. You can talk. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. Trust me. He will. I'm going to sit here in silence. All right. You are not. I'll bet. Let's make a bet. We can't go. What do you think? How Two long? minutes. Uh, okay, let's make right, it bad. Go. I say less. So I'm from Yonkers, New York, the YO, YO for life. <laughs> it's a thing, so I'm trying to get him to obviously talk now. But grew up there, I went to SUNY Oswego, um, have had a chip on my shoulder because like Yonkers sits in the shadow of Scarsdale, SUNY Oswego sat in the shadow of Syracuse, and you were just told like, you're never going to make it, you're never yep. going to make it. And that just puts the battery in your back. And then just to keep with the chip, I started at the NFL, which I was told I was an assistant, but a lot of the gentlemen there like to remind you that you were just a secretary. But I had two amazing bosses who just allowed me the runway to learn as much as I could, to take on as much as I could. I was there for 10 years, for 10 seasons, um, which is where I was lucky enough to meet this gentleman to my left. And while there, worked in every area. It was an MBA at a company. There's no degree that would have taught me what I learned. So it was everything from corporate sponsorship, live events, kids events, um, entertainment marketing. I started that division um, in like 94, 95, um, which I laugh at everybody now talking about blending sports and music, which I mean, you and I have both been doing for Never. almost 30 years now. And after the 10th season, I had an opportunity to go to a record company, which at the time seemed like a good idea, which I always look at nothing's a failure if you've learned from it. And I had a great probably 11 months there and learned that that's not where I wanted to be. And that's when I left and moved to Hollywood to work at the firm. So, wow. And it's funny because clearly like the difference in some of our parallels, though, are that you went first from sports into music, and I obviously went from music into sports. The NFL as we see it now, and you did well, that was two minutes. You crushed it. No, not yet, not okay. Yet. okay. The NFL as we know it now is a behemoth, one of the biggest companies in the world, if you look at it that way, and, and pretty bulletproof in, in that the ratings will always go up, revenue always comes in. But in 1990s, four, 93, whenever you started, what was the scene in the office in New York and you know, did you realize that you were working for this level of behemoth or was it still just like a job, your first job out? It was behemoth back then. I, I mean, I think just because you have so many more outlets that football is consumed, you have social media. But when we were there, we always said, if we sold widgets, this place would be closed. But you're selling football, yeah. which at the end of the day, even though it's now three days a week, it's still appointment. Like you they're always going to have that over the other leagues, whereas you've got so many baseball games and basketball games, but you know Thursday, Sunday, and Monday, it's appointment TV. And I think it was Commissioner Goodell who said they're the best reality show in the game. Well, sometimes yeah. Saturdays, too. Yes, and, you know, at the end of the season. Taking over. But I will say, since my two minutes are up. Here we um, go. Um, for me, 93, coming into the NFL and coming up to the offices, 
it didn't. It's nowhere near the behemoth it is now. Yeah. Because back then, one reason I got connected with Constance and Tracy Perlman at the NFL is they started doing these events, golf tournaments, and all these things, and and like skill challenges because they needed to fill airtime that the NFL got from broadcast, and yeah. they had nothing to put in those spaces. <laughs> and now they are a full fledged production company, entertainment Studio, company yeah. on top of just football. So. I, the, the the breadth of what they do now was small. What they do what back then is small in comparison. To what I think they it was do the now. building blocks. Like I started an NFL Super Bowl concert series, literally at the NFL Experience, where I would trade Super Bowl tickets for these bands to come perform, and I'd get them on the come up, and then they would just stay loyal to us and mm-hmm. still do the big things when you needed them. But I mean, we locked in Hootie and the Blowfish for Super Bowl Thirty in Phoenix in the summer before they hit to open their tailgate party. And my boss at the time was like, are you crazy telling me you want to book a no-name band? And I said, trust me, by Super Bowl, they're going to be huge. I said, and if I'm wrong, publicly fire me and we'll book Cool and the Gang as like backup. This is- That would have been dope. It was dope. dope. Yeah. Like, I only want to be with you <laughs> to celebrate. <laughs> and, and that was it. But by that Super Bowl, you know, seven Grammy nominations, seven million albums mm. sold, and that was when they were like, just go. And what appears to feel like every Super Bowl as well, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Somehow well, performing well, now, it's something. It's funny now because if you look at like Super Bowl halftime shows and even the national anthem or America the Beautiful, it's almost like people go, Oh, there's this uh, Rihanna, a football game around oh, Rihanna. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or a football game around the halftime entertainment. Oh, question. And they promote the halftime entertainment as much as they promote the game. Yeah. And, um, you know, so sports and entertainment and the businesses that, you know, all of us are involved in started 30 years ago or a long time ago without even knowing is now everyone wants to do it, yeah. kind of make it the mainstream. Do, do you think that Roger Goodell, because like I, I had the privilege of, getting to know David Stern a little bit before he passed away. And it felt like he really had this vision. And obviously Michael Jordan inspired a lot of it of where the league was and how it could be this entertainment vehicle. But the NFL didn't have to rely on that, like you said, because people have always like religiously watched football. Did you get the feeling when you were there, like, okay, they see where this is going, they see the opportunity. Was there a bit of that foreshadowing? Because NFL players, with outside of exceptions like yourself, have not developed their brand to the same level or have as much influence in like pop culture as the NBA does, for instance. Well, they have helmets on. Yeah. And that was another project we actually worked on together. Um, I created, co-created and produced a show called NFL Under the Helmet, which was obviously you know getting these guys in front of it, I mean, seeing their faces, but the fun thing was we taped in L.A., we flew out to L.A. and filmed out there, and we'd have a band or rappers. Like, our first show, which Rob Stone and I worked on together, was Run DMC, you know, and then Puffy, and just really, they gave us the runway, meaning commissioner. Well, he wasn't the commissioner yet. Um, Tagley, but was still in charge, but all the suits, I had to literally go and lay out, like, who Puffy was and why it was so important to have him. And they just, I have to give them so much credit. They really just trusted me with all that. And speaking of sports and music, um, because I know we'll have time to edit this, if your producers could look up two CDs called NFL Country and NFL Jams, starring Michael Strahan, it would be great if you could play that. Yeah, what's that about? I was a bit player on these two CDs that they did. Tell us, who'd you perform with? Um, Escape. Oh, I like that. Um, was the first, but that they kind of screwed me on that. To be honest with you. Do your do your rap. I'll be honest with you. What happened? Because I'm in the studio here all night. Only good thing is I got to see you know, Fat Joe and Big Pun came in and walked through to go to their studio. <laughs> that was a highlight. Other than that, I'm in there writing rhymes all night, and then they get me in the booth after hours. And they're like, "Okay, Michael, we just need you to go East Coast. Come on, come on. <laughs> West Coast. Come on." I'm like, "What? I wrote these rhymes." Jay Z ain't got nothing <laughs> on me, and I couldn't even spit my rhymes, man. So they cut me out, basically. That's all I got. Chuck Smith and some other guys got a chance to rhyme <laughs> on the thing. I got nothing. They just wanted you to be Flavor Flav. Yes, and then they knew. I mean, I guess Constance and them were like, "Okay, that that was a little screwed up." So they put me on a, a album, NFL Country. So I, yeah, and I sang a song called um, uh, "Never Seen a Brinks Truck Follow a Hearst." And I got to sing it with Randy Travis. And uh, it was amazing. I went to Nashville, 
sang this song with him, and that would have been a number one hit if Randy Travis would have, you know, let my vocals shine a little bit more. At That's... least when that didn't get cut, though. <laughs> no, wow. that didn't get. But it was it was a great, incredible experience, and and to, like record with Randy Travis, who's like a titan country music. It, just to give these opportunities and, and being there from the beginning, literally, and watching them create opportunities for NFL players that, you know, it was, it was the infancy of it. So now when I see guys do things, and I think I think a lot of guys probably think it was just, has always been that way. Yep. And they kind of feel like this is just what deserving and it's supposed to happen for us. And it wasn't there. You that You had to literally be there on the ground floor or come up with an idea or – trust them with ideas and I think that's what helped me is being around Constance and and Tracy and they were like okay we're gonna do this you in and I'm like yeah I'm in I'm, yeah. Well, I'll try anything why not yeah. it's gonna be fun he was and we had a great to work time with, with not it. just like in front of the camera or in the in the booth but there was one year we were doing um, a, a golf tournament like it was a fun golf challenge which we're bringing back yes and we had no boss at the time. Like there was just changeover. And it was, so we keep referring to Tracy Prom and Tracy and I came up together and she's now the senior vice president of player engagement. She's amazing, has been there this whole time. And we looked at each other. And again, this is the nineties, not that that much has changed, but we said, we looked at each other and we're like, these sponsors aren't gonna wanna hear from a 30 year old woman. So we went to Strahan, we're like, can you host this for us? Cause we have nobody to welcome everybody. He's like, okay, you know, give me the, give me the script. Went up there, did his thing. Did you, you know, because you mentioned young players today, young athletes, probably not realizing that only 20, 30 years ago, this was in no way the norm. Mm -hmm. And they enter into the league professionally at 17 and they're using, you know, certain phrases and have knowledge of things that most 17 year olds don't. Some of the most astute young business minds. But most players back then probably not only didn't think it was a possibility, just didn't crave it or want it. Were you different always? Like, I, it seems like you wanted to show up for the league early in your career. And, I, and that is rare as well, right? Like that connection of league being able to reach right out to player and being able to get them to show up for something doesn't happen like that. What was your attitude about off the field early in your career? I, was, I needed something to do in the off season or during the season because it's a lot of time off. And, and what am I going to do, sit at home every day? I mean, I'm young. My mind's working. I want to do something. And I just found what, what they were doing was, was, was fun. It was engaging. I never could, I can't say that I ever said, I'm doing this because it's going to lead to this and lead to that. And I'm going to be on TV and I'm going to work closely with the NFL to build this career. My career was playing football. I never realized that was my primary job. And I've never thought about the secondary because I always said, don't mess up the primary working on the secondary. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, no, I, I just did it because it was fun and I enjoyed doing stuff with Constance and Tracy Perlman and the NFL. Mark and Mark that. But they were fun, fun things. And, and I, I, they're just engaging. So, no, I never looked at it in a, certain, in a way to think that, you know, this is going to be my future. Yeah. But the ability to go do something without the pressure um, just to have fun doing it, ended up being my future. Yeah. Ended up preparing me. When I look back at doing those things and be in front of an uh, audience of people looking you straight in the face, I was never comfortable with that. And I still am not. I'm still not comfortable that in a, with that in a lot of ways. But I understand if I got to put on that mask to go out there and perform and work, I can do it and I can mm -hmm. be damn good at it. But it all comes back from those days and all the little things I had to do along the way and shows that I shot that people never saw, interviews that I did that I'm glad people never saw. <laughs> I, all those things add up to a career. And we get so many people in concerts will tell you, oh, what a transition. That was such an easy transition. Boy, it's seamless. And we look at each other and go, if they only knew yeah. Everything else it took to get there, yeah. you know. And still, I mean, we still get no's all the yeah. time. Oh my <laughs> god, yeah. And okay, so 2007, 2008, you know, probably responsible. You are for one of my five favorite days of my entire <laughs> life. If you had stayed, like everyone in New York wanted you to, probably would have been responsible. Let's just say for two, right? Because we probably would have won the next year. We were rolling. We, you would have kept plaques out the club. Yeah, kept you would have club. Yeah, yeah, all that. Made a little more responsible. <laughs> yes. But, yeah, I look at that, too. And I always think most guys, when you win one, you come back for that. Even if you're at the end of your career, you come back for that swan song year. But I, I turned it off. Said I'm done. 
and I'm in Greece. I'll never forget. I never really took trips or did anything great like that, but I said, all out. I went to Greece. I'm in Greece. I get a call from my agent, and the Giants want me to come back. And they're willing to double up my salary. Um, they were going to gonna take camp. care You're of gonna me. You're going to make me so upset I didn't have right to do now. training camp. They were going to take care of me. You know, Coughlin's going to take care of me during the week and everything else. But that's never what I asked for. I even had Steve Tisch takes me to dinner with Peter Berg. Mm -hmm. And Peter Berg, big Giants fan, convinced, they're trying to convince me. And I'm like, hmm. And Peter to this day would go, I thought I had you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yep. like, mm -hmm, yeah, great. Oh, but, my God. But the thing is, I never cheated the game. Like, I was always all in or I wasn't going to be in. And I turned it off. And I knew in order to go back, I was literally going back just for the money. Yeah. And I never played in a lot of ways for money. I, at that point, I wanted respect. And I didn't want I didn't want to be on the field and have a player look at me and go, man, I remember when you used to be like used to be. I'm still here. Yeah. I never wanted that. But had I gone back, then all these things that I'm doing now wouldn't have happened because yep. the timing of being available to do these things wouldn't have been there. Yeah. Because I would have been on the field. And top of mind, in your prime, coming off of a Super Bowl season, all of Let it. Let people think you can still do it. Yep. I think that's been the best part of it, even though I know I I was at the point of where I had like one, maybe two years, but one good year left in me. But you had Tuck, you had OC, these guys were yep. balling. Matthias. They didn't call me old man. We're going to kick you out the league, old man. That's what they tell me in the meetings all the time, which was, you know, and fun. Yeah. But in my mind, when they would go home at night, I'd have to run extra on the treadmill. I'd have to lift extra weights. I'd have to sit in the ice tub more. I'd have to do all the massage, chiropractic, acupuncture, all these things just to keep up with a guy who could roll out of bed and go out there and perform like they could at 20-something years yep. old. And I, I, it's a young man's game at that point, I realized, and I yep. was done. Tuck and them were like – they just saw it as possessions. They were like, man, get him out of here, right? So, oh, <laughs> yeah. oh. Well, you know, Tuck used to always, OC was starting on the right side. Yeah. Tuck would come in for me, and then he'd come in and fill in for Fred Robbins and Barry and the guys in the middle because uh, he could. He was the guy who could be versatile. I mean, yeah. incredible to play inside and outside like he could. But he every time he said, I'm going to kick you out the league, old man, I'd look <laughs> at him and say, hey, let me tell you something, young man. As long as I decide to play, You'll always be my backup. <laughs> <laughs> but in my head, I'm like, this young cat has no idea how much work it's taken yeah. to stay out here so he doesn't take my job. But I'm, I got a chance to play in different eras, man. I played with LT, had my era with Armstead and, and Seahorn and those guys. And I had I stuck around long enough to steal some time in their era. And, and I'm happy I did because it was the most fun I ever had because the only time I had to play without the pressure. You know, my last year, I said, I don't care about sacks. I don't care about any of those things. I just want to have fun. And that's really the approach I take now at yep. work. I want to have fun. And having fun has really turned into an incredible business for us. Yep. And, um, you know, it's a life lesson. Just go to work every day with joy. The only thing you can do is control is your attitude. That's right. Because we get thrown a lot of curveballs, and we look at each other, and we deal with them. What, when, but what, do you think walking away was easier because – you started to realize you were good at all these other things too. I didn't know any of that. Well, she'll tell you how we our business got started together because I was floundering, and I and I I want all the the former athletes, if anybody watches this, to understand. They may look at my career now and think when he was done, he just rolled right over there and it was smooth. No, it wasn't because even though I had a job at Fox, three weeks in, I didn't know if I was going to be any good at yeah. that because I'm on that set, man. And I got all these thoughts in my head, and then that camera hits me. And brother, when I tell you, <laughs> I used to look at Jimmy and go, oh, did anything I say make sense? <laughs> and he used to go, I don't know, I wasn't listening to you. I was like, you know, but, and after three weeks, I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. And, um, and you know, Khan has been, my father was my biggest influence as far as belief, right? My dad said when, not if, always when. Because when is no doubt it's going to happen if you're doubting. And from where my dad left off, Khan picked up. Because there were times I was like, hmm. And she said, this is what you're going to do. And just so matter of fact, and with such belief in me, that it's like, okay, if she doesn't doubt, how can I doubt myself? Yeah. But for all these guys who think it was just an easy transition, you roll into it and, you know, you just move on. No. No matter what I've ever done from going to space to anything, never, ever replace the feeling of putting on a uniform and walking out into a, a stadium mm -hmm. ever. Yep. 
You know, it's crazy that you just said going to space. Like, it's like wild, Like, matter right? of fact, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was a flex, bro. Man, You're I, like eight, was, one of eight people. Yeah, that was a little, that was, that was cool. That was, that, was, that, that was fun to watch, too. Um, if you have any juice, I actually told another friend of mine who's friendly with Jeff Bezos, but I, I need to get up into space. You would do it? Oh, my God, yes. Especially if I was with him. Like, that's yeah. like... Would you do a concert? So, ab, ab, so let take us, man. When we went, <laughs> when we got there to the to the um, First, uh, yeah, facility, blast off. I don't Horn, even know what it's in called. the middle of Van Horn, Texas. It's middle in of the middle of nowhere. I was like, absolutely not. And then sitting there, just watching my best friend, you know, brother from another mother, business partner, going up. Like, I was like, oh my god, why the f did I let him do this? <laughs> but then. You're just, you're almost crying because it's just so emotional to think like he's going to space right now. And then, I mean, just the other funny thing of it all is you're standing there with Tony Gonzalez, Jeff Bezos and Lauren Sanchez and I'm clutching Tony's neck and Lauren's like, Jeff, grab her hand. So like it was surreal seeing him, but I was having a surreal moment where like Bezos is trying to calm me down because I was like, I can't That's believe wild. this. So it, oh, you guys then, are just flexing yeah. all over the place right no, now. I, yeah. I, like, I wasn't going to do I'm it. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, I, I was scared to do it. I, I, for, when I first went there, I was I no way I could do it, but I went to cover when Jeff did it. Yep, of course. And I watched it and I'm like, that is the craziest that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen, especially when that booster rocket comes down and then it fires up and then it lands itself like back on Iron the paddock Man. like Iron Man. It just Man. comes back I down like, in this oh little my circle. God. I like, said, that is the coolest thing. And then to see the the, the joy and like his face and his brother Mark's face and, and, and then interviewing him afterwards. And we had dinner like a month or so later with, with Jeff and his brother Mark and Tony and the girls. And I was like, you know what? I never thought about going to space. I said, hell no. I would actually do it. That was the coolest thing I've ever seen. And a few days later, I swear I get a call like, yeah, I think you know what this is about. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And a week before, I was like, what did I do? What did I do? Oh, my God. <laughs> That's wild. It ended up being great, though, man. It's about the, one of the best experiences I'm sure. Life, ever. Um, just even listening to the two of you, it reminds me it's different but my banter with kevin our trust in one another our relationship and you know i've got to study some other partnerships that i'm you know always impressed by look at jimmy Iovine and dr dre is one and when i watch the two of you like it's something that you can't explain and that's what like the sign of a great partnership is and then there's this deep-rooted trust and belief and you knowing what to say at the right time, all of these things which you just can't study, you can't put in a textbook, can't do anything of the sort. Um, But you started this company in 2011. What was the kind of like thought process when you looked at each other? What was the vision for what this was? And what do you think the quality, obviously on paper you've explained a little bit of why you guys gravitated towards one another, but you know, especially for athletes, there's a trust issue a lot. And at that time, still, it was very much like everybody's out to get you. Stories of athletes going broke. Um, but here you are about to partner up and start this whole endeavor in your life. What was it that you were like, it's her? It's her. This is the woman I'm going to partner with and build my business with. Because it's like finding your spouse. It's like finding your partner in life. Well, it was it was crazy because I had someone else back in the day who used to rep me um, here in New York. Nice gentleman, very nice guy. Um, but I felt like I, in a lot of ways, had kind of I guess outgrown that relationship. And I would I lived in L.A. at the time. Con was in L.A. and I was off season, man. I don't have to work out anymore. At that point, I really wasn't playing golf. I don't know why. I was just doing nothing, floundering. <laughs> so I would go to the office all the time, and I was sitting there, and she talked about stuff she's doing, and I always had all these comments on, well, why don't you think this, and do that, and try this, and try that. And then anything that I was doing, I would run by her. Like, you know, what do you think about this? And she didn't manage me at all or do anything. And eventually, I decided that you know she was the right person to run my business because her advice was always spot on and I trusted her because we had this relationship from 1994 three mm-hmm. or four and on top of it she got tired of me coming into the office <laughs> and giving an opinion so she finally said um if you're gonna come in here you need to either do two things one you need to shut up <laughs> or two become a partner so you get actually talking <laughs> would you say me something in here <laughs> yeah and I decided, too, was the better option. Yeah, yeah. 
So our stories uh, usually align. Yeah, and you obviously trusted the relationship enough to say that because it's still Michael Strahan. I mean, that's the thing that happens to you know a lot of. I don't know how big of a sports fan you were growing up, but you know a lot of my life's work comes from like true love and passion and and following it and studying it. You know, it's embarrassing, but I would probably be able to tell you where I was reading about them contacting you in Greece and trying to get you there. That's how much I love sports and New York sports. Um, you know, but for you, you must have, you know, you, you, you came up into this and you see Michael Strahan, you're about to start this business with him. And that's never old for us, right? Like that never gets old when I get to meet people that are the best at what they do. And that's not just in sports. I really have always marveled at that. But did you feel like you could do this like at that point because I'll tell you there's a second in my head when I go and I leave to start this business with Kevin where I know I can do it but I'm like yo what am I doing like really what am I going to do it was a unique set of circumstances so I was managing Snoop Dogg I turned 40 and I said I love you but I, I got I need my life back so I always maintained a great relationship with him and his wife and the kids and the family but at that point you know, I was working for somebody else and they were kind of like, all right, without him, you're not really bringing money in. So you should probably figure out what your next play is. So at this point I was managing Michael and I was afraid to go on my own own. So I started the first iteration of this with somebody else. Cause I just was like, okay, I need somebody. And I think because I started at the NFL at such a young age, I didn't look at any of these guys as superheroes, the superheroes that they are, but they were peers because they all treated me that way, and we just had such a great relationship. Like, my first run-in with a player was with Lawrence Taylor, and you obviously know who he is. You clearly know who he is, but for the fans that don't, just Google him. And I was at a training camp in the summer of 1991. We brought sponsors, and I was assigned to him. And so, you know, he's getting paid to go have lunch and I think you were fairly Dickinson doing. Yep, fairly. Yeah, so you'd go into. Fairly ridiculous, as we <laughs> called it back then. But you'd go in the cafeteria <laughs> and whatever. And so I, I find him. He says, All right, meet me at my car on the sideline. LT didn't walk to the practice field, he drove his car. So I meet him at his car. He's nowhere to be seen. I freak out. So I start running around trying to find him. I finally, like 15 minutes later, I find him at the cafeteria. And he's like, Where the were you? And I'm like, where the, were you? And I just got right in his face, not realizing it's Lawrence Taylor. Yeah. It was just, this was my job at the point. And I think that's what really set me up for working, whether it's Michael or Coach Prime or Snoop even. I wasn't yeah, a music manager. Yeah. Got it. You, can, you know you can curse on the show. Oh, I can. Are I, you can. Doing? I was trying to be polite. I just want her to know she can curse on this. Not, oh, it's not GMA. <sighs> I can relax now. I've been like on my Let P's and Q's. But that's why I don't think I panicked when we said partner because we'd already had, I don't even know at that point, 15 years of a friendship, relationship, was managing him, and then coming off of Snoop's trajectory and crossing him over from the gangster rapper to the global superstar, it just was natural. And if I ever do stop and think about it, I mean, I pee in my pants a little bit, because you're just like, these people are trusting me with their careers. And some of what you're talking about, so I don't think about it. It's always the gut, the instinct, yeah. you know, and you just roll with it. And I mean, we didn't know what this was going to be. It started from my kitchen table, and then a very dear friend of ours, Jody Gerson, who you know well, gave us office space at Sony TV. And we had the NHL as a client. We were helping them with their entertainment. And we had Michael and Dion. Yeah. And I think another music act. But that was it, you know, and it just kind of hustled like you're broke. That's our motto, yep. and that's how we still operate it. And now we have... Well, I joke about three offices. So we have New York, LA, and then we just opened up a satellite office in Boulder. Oh, wow. Oh, obviously, yeah. So Boulder, obviously, because of, of Dion. So let's jump all the way to 2023, and you guys have done so much together. And the partnership, but the other athletes that you guys represent. And from the outside looking in, it looks like you guys in a lot of ways have built the blueprint for a lot of NFL players, ex-athletes, and really ex-athletes in general, to – look at what they're going to do in this next stage of their life and have a real like methodical approach to doing it. It looks like you're very thoughtful, very planned. There's multiple levers you can pull. And that's what, you know, again, from the outside looking in makes your business unique. Tell me, you know, in your words, and then chime in here. I'm not going to put you any more two minutes. It's your show, baby. Um, what makes up smack today? 
SPAC stands for sports, media, and culture, and that's what makes us up. And what we've really fought hard is to keep our culture. Um, it's a very relaxed atmosphere at the office, very team building. If you come in and you've got a cutthroat attitude with each other, we don't want you there. You like you have to be cutthroat for the negotiations, but not not internally. And I think that's where the sports of it all comes from that he was an athlete I you know worked at a sports league it's all about teamwork for us and that even goes for our clients our productions our our brand incubation like everybody has to have that same DNA or we don't want to be in business with you we've lost I mean we've left a lot of money on the table by not wanting to work with certain people but you can't put a price tag on your piece and yeah. also I mean I, I think we mentioned we got here Corel Chen who oversees the Strahan brands and Where by Aaron Andrews and Snoop Doggy Dog's pet line and is getting married and is getting and married is getting next married. weekend yeah. yeah congratulations but she was an intern she started with us as a junior in NYU um, basically skipped her senior year and she started out with us um, working on his Hall of Fame induction which they had to change the whole Pro Football Hall of Fame yeah. after our party and his induction <laughs> yeah, they did. It was a good one. <laughs> and then she was working with us on Wiz Khalifa and then we saw like just like we identified talent like Michael I, we identified talent in the company and we moved her over to working on his clothing line which in the beginning I know she wasn't thrilled about but now she's I mean just yeah running it so but that's yeah, I, important yeah and I, I think that it's about working with the right people and and whenever you are the the guess you want it for lack of a better word the head of a company the culture of the company is going to be what you give it so if you come in and you're you mistreat people if you're ice cold then that's what your company's going to feel like that's what your employees they're going to come to work and they're going to hate coming to work when i was a rookie with the giants i hated going in because being a rookie was not nice back in 93. And that's one thing I never wanted the young guys to feel like. So every young guy, I took time to get to know them, to talk to them, and, and understand what makes everybody tick. So I knew I can go to a young guy, and I knew this guy I gotta yell at. That guy I can just talk to. Just every once random, how's your, how's your daughter doing? How's mm -hmm. your mom? It's very little things, right, that make people know that you see them, yep. and that they matter. And I, and I think that's the culture at Smack is like we want people to know that they matter to yeah. us. It's more of a family feel instead of a corporate feel where you walk into an office and you're just another number. And I think the reason that it, we've been very selective, and, and Khan's been great at this, very selective on who we represent mm -hmm. um, and the way in which we represent them. If, if it's someone that we do work with because all the time I get, hey, you guys want we want talent. We we we're talent. We want to work with you. We want to try this. Are you guys open to it? And it it takes a lot to get them to say yes. And I'm not gonna go in and bogart and say, hey, we're gonna work with this person. It's not like that. Because at the end of the day, everybody in this company has got to deal with this individual. And if they don't fit, they don't fit. Yeah. And so many things along the way, as Khan said, we've lost out on so much um, you know, financially because we won't work with certain people. Mm -hmm. Or there will be some things that come along that are, could be really lucrative, but it doesn't fit that yeah. person. It doesn't fit my brand. It doesn't fit our brand. And we just have to let it go yeah. because at the end of the day, all you got is your attitude, your your integrity, yeah. right? What was and the show in Israel? We, oh, there was the show in Israel this that is we wanted to do, man. Example. This show was amazing. We're in Israel, <laughs> um, and we're obviously on the same page because I'm. We're up late, like it's two, three in the morning. This show is on. I text dating him. I'm like, naked. Are you up? I'm like, turn to this channel. It's called <laughs> Dating Naked. Dating Naked, right? You ever seen the show? No, dude. It's the most Go amazing on YouTube show. After. It's like. That there, you, you, somebody comes out with the host, and they're talking about dating, and they, they, they introduce these people, and they're coming, they're behind the screen. The screen comes up a little bit to show, like, waist down, naked, butt naked. Butt naked. And then they're commenting, like, you know, nah. the scrotum is a little too saggy for me. Shut the or, fuck up. Or with the women, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, they talk, it, dude. And then it comes up a little bit more, and they eliminate people <laughs> as they go. <laughs> this and you, is every about question as fucked was up asked. of a show concept I've ever heard. It's, 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 we it's, we it's couldn't could stop watching off. it. I'm sure. This is insane. Insane. And then once you choose somebody, you both go backstage, you both come out naked. And you go on a naked date. Then you go on a date. No, you don't go on a naked date. You go on a date. Now, if you get naked at the end of the date, that's on you. Yeah. But you go on a date with Kobe. You do come out at the end of the show naked with the person you chose. 
And we were like, we got to bring that. But then they couldn't, you couldn't get away with it here. No. There was well, a, especially Michael being in not Walt you. Disney. By the way, you know. we're getting close to it being somehow like there is a home for it here, sadly. Also but yeah, cable network I, yeah. But I agree streaming. with you. It might not be the one you that want. Was off uh, Mike, <laughs> Mike I standing I'm in front of. I'm still into it. I'm sorry. I'm still into it. All right. Well, I'm gonna watch some on YouTube when I leave here. That's dating like, naked. Dating naked. Dating naked. <laughs> with Coach Prime. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it, this is something, and, uh, and this is the best interviews for me is when I'm can honestly learn like peer to peer and really, um, pick up on some of the things you guys are saying, because as my business has evolved, you know, younger in, when I was younger, I, I repped a handful of musicians and DJs and athletes, and then chose to really focus on building a business, um, and building IP and building an asset. But I'm a manager. Like that's what I came from. That's what I've been doing my whole career. But the reluctance has been because how can I replicate this relationship? How can I replicate the magic? You know what I'm saying? The same magic the two of you have. And you can't probably. And I would imagine you have different magic with different clients and you chime in and, and have your own relationship with different clients as well. Um, but is that part of it? Is that like it is so hard to figure out who to work with at times or to understand how you can scale what this magic was? Because... What the two of you have, and even if you compromise a deal or you pass on something, what the two of you have, you're doing it collectively and you're making more money later on because of it, without knowing it. You've made more money on something else because you passed on that. But those are the things that I think about. If I go and rep four or five other people, I'm running a media company, I built this entire business around Kevin, and how do you do that and look at all of your roster of athletes and, and personalities, but never lose this. I'll tell you why. For me, I understand the responsibilities of everybody in the company, right? I understand her responsibility. I understand my responsibility. I know my responsibility isn't to wake up every day and go in and run the business day to day. I understand it's not what I do. That's what she does. That's what April Godone, who we hired to be our COO, um, does. That's what Corral does. That's what Jose does, running there to different divisions. Um, my, my job is to know what's going on within the company. And I tell them, I read everything. There are emails that go out and come to anything, I don't read it. Then I'll eventually have to chime in and let them know, you know, someone misspelled something right there. Let them know just, you're just, watching. Yeah, just to let them know I'm watching. But I, I have realized that what my strengths are, I got to lean on those, right? And one of the strengths that I have in our relationship in a lot of ways is just getting us in the room, right? You get us in the room. And then I know I have the people around me to support that. But also to know that I need to make sure that we can stay in the room by showing that I know what the hell is going on. One of the worst things is to go into a meeting because everyone looks and they go, oh, the athlete, he's got him in here. Oh, shit, I'm going to get my kid a football signed and take a picture and that's it. But no, once we're in that room, I guarantee you I know what's going on. I'm going to show you I know what's going on and I'm going to take the pressure off of them. And I remember the first time we were working on a clothing brand. This is getting embarrassing for you, Constance. We're working on our co clothing brand deal and we're in a meeting with um, J.C. Penney, they had co co CEOs at the time, and we're in there pitching them about, you know, starting a clothing brand with them, suits and everything else. And I know that they looking at, they're looking, going, okay, we got the athlete in here, but she's gonna do all the talking. And I think she thought that, but I, from the beginning of the meeting, took over. This is what we're gonna do. This is our demographic. This is why we think it, what's gonna work. This is the what we're trying to hit. This is the price points which we hit. This is. And the guys, I talk, then, then the two CEOs talk, then goes the Constance, and I look over there, she's crying. <laughs> Tears. Tears. I was like, the student just became the teacher. And I'm sitting there going, I'm like, not now. Like, not now. This ain't the time and for that. And I'm not emotional, like, so I'm it was like, go. truly like, yeah, oh my like, gosh. This ain't time for that shit, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible but it was important for me and I think that's why this works because I know that she knows if she can't do something that she can hit me and I can do it and yep. I know 100% she's got my back she's got to talk me out of doing stuff because she's like I know it's a lot of money but it ain't gonna work yep and because I know her interest and her ability to see long term is unbelievable yeah never seen anybody that's I get the gift 
And she'll call. I had a dream last night. That's like, amazing. okay, <laughs> 3 a.m., okay, what sleep. are you dreaming about? And it's like something that she throws out there. She goes, you're going to think I'm crazy, but she's right. And that's how these words, and they get overused, but that's how these words were meant to be used. That's what a visionary is. I mean, that's legitimately you have the ability to, to see something and then build towards it. And I, I'd like to think that I do the same. And then the beauty is that the journey there, even if it ends up being that the vision was wrong, is really the joy of all of this. And like you said, you learn from it. Um, you know, we talk about other athletes. I know Smack is not just management. You guys create original content. You consult for brands. You create original consumer brands with your talent. All things that were needed in the sports landscape. You had these like relationships like Maverick and Rich and Randy with LeBron and they could do it. But then agencies would say, we're going to do the same thing. But that's not easy. You can't scale that. You can't say every athlete goes to an agency and gets the exact same thought and vision and strategy as we were able to do or that you're able to do or that Tom's able to do. And agencies are evolving. But you guys built this from the beginning knowing because of who you are that what someone needs from their company is if they're going to build a consumer skincare brand or they want to have a deal with men's warehouse or if they want to have a Netflix reality show that you have to be able to do all of this and to treat all of them like their own enterprise and the only other person you know that can even and all of the town on your roster is special you are in this elite company but Dion is as well in this elite company and someone like him comes into the conversation when did you guys start working with him and where was he at in his career when you first kind of aligned with prime he just retired maybe for two years i think he'd been out and when i was working with snoop i helped him start the snoop youth football league and every year at the super bowl dion and snoop's teams would play in the snooper bowl and that's how I reconnected with Dion because I didn't have a relationship with him like I did with Michael or Tony Gonzalez or any of the guys. And I get a call from him and he says, who handles all of Snoop's marketing? I was like, I do. And he said, well, who handles this? I said, well, we have a team around us, but I'm the GM. Like yeah. I'm telling everybody what's going on. I said, what's up? And he said, I need to make a change with my team. And I was looking for some suggestions. I said, well, what about me? And he was like, oh, great. And as I've gotten to know him, that's <laughs> Is it him. that easy? Um it wasn't even that. He didn't want to ask me. Got it. Like he needed you for me. You needed to throw it out I needed there. to throw it out there to him. And when we started working together, and, and he's very um, in tune with where he was with his brand, it was really hard to get any brand partners to come on board because he didn't have the greatest reputation. And I said, look, we're going to find the right partner. And if they're going to pay you a dollar, but it's a national campaign and we get you back out there, we're doing it. And to his credit, he rolled with it, trusted me. And here we are, you know, 15 years later, 14 years later. And similar to when Stray, you know, filled in for Regis and he comes back to the dressing room and I was like, this is what you're going to do. Dion, I met him at the net and if he was working at the NFL Network and he had the Truth League, he'd been coaching his kids his whole post career. Like he would have had a different TV career than Michael, but he could have had something pretty big. He wouldn't leave Dallas. It's all about the kids. So when Shador was leaving to go to college, she said, okay, I have an idea. Um, my, I just reached out to Florida State, you know, my alumni, and I want to help them recruit. So I reached out to the AD, and I'm going to help them recruit. I go, no, you're not. He's like, what do you mean? I said, we're going for a head coaching job. I said, just because you haven't done it at the collegiate level, you've got the skills. And he always says this in his recruiting meetings. He was the kid being recruited. He's been the parent of a kid being recruited and now he's the recruiter. Like he knows how the game is played. I said, you've got all this. Now, what these guys all know about me, I'm really good at what I know, but I'm better at what I don't know. And I didn't know the college coaching landscape. So we tapped in a really good friend of ours, Jordan Bejan, who was a WME at the time. I said, will you do this with us? And that's how that went with him. And this is his calling. Like I don't, I know at the height of his career, playing baseball and football, and, you know, something ESPN just put a stat out that said he's one of two people who's scored a touchdown at all six positions, which is crazy. But he's a motivator now. He's just gone into such another level. And the trust and friendship and brotherhood that they have and the, the support for each other, that's what makes our company so special, that it's not just the team. It's, it's all the 
clients as well, I think. Everybody. Like you're all the clients. We're all connected. Um, you know, and I, and I love Dion. And I, I think that D, he's truly committed to the kids. Because at first I was like, is he really? Like, it's not about the kids, really. It's like Dion prime yeah, time. Yeah. He's really committed to these kids to the point where he sacrificed the whole TV side of his career. And now I'm glad to see him doing what he's doing. He wears his pants a little too tight in the crotch oh, area. Here we go. Um, but, you know, Does Dion he know you saw that. Oh. <laughs> You'll get a soundbite. That's, that's, that's what he says to him. <laughs> that's, our, that's our thing with each other. We go back and forth about these tight fitting suits. But, but he, is, he, is a, he is an incredible dude. And he just wants to motivate yeah. these kids. And, and for him, it's more than just on the field. It's like life after. He wants these kids to have a life after because everybody's not going to play sports. It's just not realistic of anything, basketball, football, baseball, whatever it may be. But I, I, I take my hat off to, to Dion, and um, he definitely is a special one. And I think he's going to crush it at Colorado. How did you guys feel about um, – and obviously you played a big part in it, but was it emotional – for him and for everyone, the switch to Colorado? It was very emotional. Um, but he said he went in to do a job and he felt like he accomplished it. He shined a light on all HBCUs. He helped, you know, they, they were practicing at a high school. Like the field at Jackson State was not usable. So the first thing we did was like two days before Christmas, we got on a Zoom with um, the CEO of Walmart, Doug McMillan, and he said, what do you guys need? We're like, we need a football field. So it was all that where he brought everybody there. Hell, GMA was down there. I mean, Michael was out yeah. there for homecoming. And you know, and you guys, I have to say thank you because you are just been the biggest supporter of his whole coaching career. And we'll literally rattle off all the stats you guys are posting and repost and oh, we're just, cool. it's, you have no idea the impact you make um, on, on all of us. But it wasn't easy. But at the same time, he's a very spiritual man. And even when he was deciding if it was going to be Colorado or some of the other schools I was talking to, he calls me up and he said, okay, God just spoke to me. Let's go to Colorado. Mm -hmm. And we called the AD and we're like, we coming. We yeah. coming. But he'd done so much for HBCUs. And I, I went to HBCU. It's a struggle, man. It's tough. And, and he's still doing it. He's, he's doing a camp. Did you know this? He's, he's doing a camp. Camps. He still he's does the camps. Camp. He does the combines for these kids. And he's never been about just my JSU athletes. He's inviting every school. Every school. HBCUs, bring your kids. Let these scouts get a chance to see these kids who they may not um, have gotten a chance to see and give them possibly an opportunity. Yeah. And, and, and so for me, watching the amount of attention that HBCUs have gotten, I've – we played on BET once when I was in college. Mm -hmm. Once. And I, it was like Monday Night Football. I'm out there, guys, painting my spats and trying to look sweet. Yeah. Like it, was, <laughs> it was like John Madden's about to call this game. I was on BET. One time. We bust everywhere. We bust to Florida to play. We bust to Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi. And they used to, like, paper bag lunches. Then we would we'd get off the bus and eat at Shoney's, all-you-can-eat buffets. Truck stop, chicken wing, got food poisoned a few times for those. But, like, all that stuff, man, it was a, such a struggle. But to see these kids now be on ESPN yep. every game weekend, you could turn on Jackson an HBCU State. game? Yeah. What? But do you think that – was that what Dion – was Was there any, like, I can't, I can't leave, I've done this? Is it, or he felt confident in the platform he had built and that he'll continue and commit to it. And I, and I get the idea that with the bigger platform, his voice is louder and he can continue to put people in position and continue to promote exhibitions and, and out-of-conference games with HBCUs. And, and he probably has a plan, I, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, and there's a couple things I don't think a lot of people know. Um, he hired the head coach, Mississippi Valley. So he brought other HBCU coaches with him. Home to Jerry Rice. Yes, home to yeah. Jerry Rice. Yeah, home of um, Steve McNair, too. Steve McNair. Oh, right. he played Alcorn. I'm sorry. Yeah, Alcorn, yeah. Yeah, um, Valley. And then a bunch of the young ladies that worked in the training room at Jackson State, now at Colorado with scholarships, you know, finishing their education there. And quite frankly, he's bringing flavor to Boulder. Yeah. I mean, we all know it's one of the whitest cities in, in the country, and <laughs> they've opened their arms up to him, and he'll – it's true. He told me I didn't have to and the filter. Mer and the merch is probably, like Colorado is probably selling. They probably make, the mm -hmm. school's making money, everything. The yeah, guys, I mean, if spring game went from no one to um, sold out stadium, 
just from last year to this year. And and it was definitely a struggle for him to leave Jackson State. Uh, but there were also struggles there internally um, that a lot of people probably don't know about that there um, for him that, um, you know, just could not be kind of worked out. Yeah. And it's kind of a shame. And But one thing I will say, he took a lot of criticism for leaving. But he didn't talk about those things because it wasn't about that. It wasn't about him. It was about moving on, moving forward, and helping more kids and and taking care of his coaches as well. And I commend him for that because um, personally I would have been like, no, these are some of the other reasons that I had to make this move. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just not the guy he is. He, yeah. He'll take you. He doesn't care. He's not even looking at the comments anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, Dion no, is He claps more, back. Every once in a while. <laughs> and they're but, good claps. But he's, but he's more focused on what he has to do because he's very aware that um, a lot of people don't want him to succeed. Yeah. And the only way to succeed is for him to nose to the grind and, the work. and put in the work. Yeah. That's what he's doing. Um, tell me everything you have personally uh, in the works right now. You talked a little bit about your skincare line. And yeah, we got the um, skincare line. We just, just rolled that out at Target now. Um, Rite Aid, um, CVS. CVS, Amazon, Amazon, MichaelStrahanSkin.com. Um, that then we have a clothing line at Men's Warehouse and J.C. Penney, and um, we do you know custom linings and all these different programs. We're rolling out our juniors line as well, um, which is which is fantastic. What else we got going on? Yeah, and tell Jeez. me everything with you just Matt. finished filming. Um, and next season of a hundred thousand dollar pyramid last week. So we oh, that'll be fun. We've yeah, gotten it down so to, to filming a whole season in a week. Four <laughs> days, twenty episodes. <laughs> Which is a, a lot a lot of shooting. But it it, it if it goes by so fast because we have so much fun on set and create a great environment there. Um then we got where by Aaron Andrews. Where by Aaron Andrews Which was is the, fun, especially because of the whole, like we said, the teamwork. So where by Aaron Andrews, if you don't know, is the female fashion forward sports license line by women for women. And as soon as coach got the job at Colorado, we're like, we need the license for where and the license for MSX. And it's, it's going to just be really cool. Next level things. And that, that's, crush. that's the fun part too, yeah. that you can we do have that. Our, we have our NFL license, my, with my brand as well as well as Aaron and she's in bas NBA. She's in um, NHL. She's in, um, MLB, in a, NFL, everything. We uh, well, what have we got a documentary that's premiering at Sundance. Uh, Tribeca. Tribeca. Tribeca, I mean. Tribeca called BS High. Okay. Which is the Bishop Sycamore. We'll invite you to this yeah. one. Which is a yeah, um, pretty, pretty incredible story. I, I, I mean, these, these kids playing against IMG and getting smoked and then come to find out it, the legitimacy behind all of it. And But actually, the fascinating thing about the documentary is you're not talking around the situation you're talking directly to, to the people in it from Roy who is the coach and the guy who created it to his partner in it to the kid to their parents and all I can say is whoa yeah whoa I can't wait to see that one way the people work is is something else man there something are endless else. incredible sports stories yes right absolutely would you say that? Oh my gosh, it's it's so interesting because we didn't set out to be this like sports production company, but it's it's working out for us. That's for sure. I mean, we still have other projects that aren't in the sports field. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got game shows, and then we just uh, got our official on um, Coach Two. I mean, Coach Two, Coach Prime season two. We started filming a couple weeks ago, and that'll be back Prime on Prime. Amazing. Which I've been loving yeah, to got, say that. But we've got so many pro Michael projects. Michael Vick with us Michael for Black Vick, Quarterback we're doing stuff. The, the Evolution of the Black Quarterback documentary. Well, I'm with Michael Vick that, that we sold. And, and Michael's been going around the country interviewing all, not just black quarterbacks. You know, I think the interesting thing when you're talking to Michael, and, and this is really when he's doing this, you're going, you're really, he's really good at talking to mm -hmm. these other quarterbacks, I was blown away by how good Michael was at this. But the thing is, with Mike, his his influences were Joe Montana, John Elway, Steve Young, Steve Young. I'm like, huh? I know. So he's talking to them, talking to Andy Reid, because it's not just a black quarterback being so good, but he had somebody who had to give them opportunity yeah. too. But also, all of them are influenced by different types of guys. So everyone would think he's influenced by Randall Cunningham or something. 
And that's just not the case. Yeah, I, that story is really incredible. I spoke to Mike years ago, um, just kind of, he was on the show actually. And it's funny because institutionally, that was one of the most broken myths ever. And one of the most like institutionally racist narratives that were created, which was that the quarterback looked like this. And then that if you weren't, they only compared to each other as if Michael Vick had to have idolized Warren Moon or Randall Cunningham, or I don't get it. What do you mean you idolize Joe Montana, right? And that really was the myth. So when scouts would look at somebody, and I'm not knocking you know, Mitchell Trubisky or Ryan Leaf, but what would happen in those instances is it checked these boxes, yeah. period. It's like if you're looking for something, and you check the boxes of what you're looking at, then you're going to get the same thing over and over again. And I think it's amazing you're telling that story because it's bigger than just like there was one or two and now there's 20. It's This was like broken at the core and had to be re-educated and like walls broken down because you cities and owners didn't want to have a black quarterback. There was like, that's not, it's my company. My quarterback's my CEO. And that's what you mm-hmm. saw and that you, didn't that, exist I, that face needs to look like this if yeah. you're going to be the head of my comp, my corporation but you know i think i think that i think people period need to realize and and especially you know athletes always hit me up about what's next and what's next and what's next and what can i do after and I, and and my thing when i look back at my career and what con has helped me build and what we built together is you got to start thinking that you're able to be a part of anything you see right you're not just stuck being an athlete who only talks about athletic things. Um, you're not just stuck um, in the sports world. You're not just stuck being someone who's told what to do. You can create things for yourself. And what you look like, in a lot of ways, I, I feel like my career has kind of redefined what is expected of athletes and what is expected from the public to think that they want to see. Because I've taken over for two of the most historic white guys in television from Regis to Dick Clark doing a game show. Who the hell would ever thought? And and to me that shows that the world has changed, still oh a lot gosh. of work to do, but the world has changed and people are willing to accept someone that is, I guess, non-traditional to do things. And I think if you're someone who, thinking about a career change, you're thinking about what your next step is or whatever, the world is open for you. Yeah. Do you you're do not you, stuck. Do you still pinch yourself at like where football has taken you? Because oh, man. It, it starts with that. And I always talk about that with Kevin. Like, we'll be sitting somewhere and I'll be like, you realize what the game of basketball just did for us? Like, yeah, we're sitting in India with the world leaders and yeah. you're building courts all over the world and people are screaming at you. And that's because of this, like the work you put into this sport. Does that still amaze you? All the time. We do that all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah, We I, do that all the time. Great. Like Thursday um i had we run our 20th show i had to leave at the end of the 19th show for pyramid and race to a preview for a movie we just produced with snoop called the underdogs and mgm was screening it to do a focus group and i was exhausted obviously but i literally like as soon as i walked into the theater i went holy shit like just produced season seven of hundred thousand dollar pyramid which is not easy especially in this climate and now i just did my first feature film like start to finish and we're going to hear what people think of it and then I was leaving to go to the spring game. I was like, oh my God, you know? And, and again, I'm so thankful for my start at the NFL, always. Like, yeah, were there hurdles and were there challenges? Of course, but again, every one of those just made me a stronger, better, smarter person and got me here today with you guys. I mean, as he knows, three years ago, I wouldn't have been here. I would have been like, no, Michael's doing it. Like, and I've she always wouldn't been- have said a word. She was, she was always kind of behind the scenes and wouldn't talk. And, and but for me, it's like there's so much that to be learned from her, and there's so much inspiration to come from from what confidence is built. Because I understand that I'm going to get a lot of credit for a lot of stuff that I don't deserve credit for. But it's important for me to let other people see that okay, you know, it's a collaboration. This is we do this together. I may be in front of the camera and everyone, oh, you're so good, and you're so this, and you're so that, but. I'm not there without this, without her, and without the team that we built around. So um, I, I think you, when you realize that your success is not all by you, the better you'll be for it. And I'm like Constance, I, I, I've had to learn to step back and go, wow. Because I was always kind of just 
living, man. Wake up, do it. What's next? Cool. What's uh, next? Went to space. Oh, cool. What's up? You know, what's next? Like yeah. it was, I, I, in my mind, for some reason, I kind of make experiences kind of downplay them a lot. And I don't know why, but yeah, now I'm learning to take a step back and go, that was pretty cool. Oh, man, I'm hanging out with this. Like this yeah. is something I never would have imagined, or I'd only see on TV, or see someone else do, and think, "Oh, how cool is that?" Now, that's my life. Yeah, and be grateful for. Well, it. every time I go into CVS or Rite Aid, I run over to the men's shaving section where their skincare is, and I'm just like, "Oh my God, we have men's skincare sitting next to these, you know, legendary brands that have been in business for how many years?" And mm. and we launched it during the pandemic. Like those are the things. And Again, we couldn't See, do it do without that. the team. I feel weird walking there. Well, display. it's different it's a for you. Different. <laughs> yeah. Like, I just feel Y'all weird. Y'all see what I did? I, and then I go, I, I must say, I have gone and, like, bought some of my own I'm stuff. sure. And it's a little weird. You're like, oh, they don't recognize me. Let me self go to self-checkout. Yeah, straight beep, up. Beep, beep, Yo, Strahan's in aisle nine staring at his exactly. own shit. <laughs> Wait, you know what? To his credit, um, when we were at Penny's Only, he'd go in and he'd literally be hanging the clothes oh, back on the rack. Oh, I my rack yeah. up, man. I remember I'm in um, J.C. Penny when we first started this business. And I go in there and I'm like re-racking and putting color, coordinating, getting it right. And some dude bumped by, he goes, he looked at the side, like, what you doing here, man? What you, why you doing that? And I said, well, if I don't care, who's going to care? Who else is going to look at and this? Who else is going to care? But we we were always very hands-on and personal with everything. That's amazing. Like with the fabrics and touching them, looking at approving them. Um, to to everything we've done, we've done. It's never been, yeah, that's a great idea. You go ahead and take it. Just throw the name on it, and 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 we'll just promote it. It's never been like that because I don't think that. Always, always would say, I did a show years ago. And it was a great experience, but it lasted one year. And I'm kind of mad at myself because I didn't trust my gut. I trusted other people. Oh, we've done this a long time. And I, but in your gut, right? And at the end of the day, when a show didn't work after one season, everyone looked at it as a failure. I looked at it as a learning experience. Yep. I learned that you know, I, acting's cool, but you know, I, it's not, I, I'm not born to naturally think it's what I actually want to do every single day. But what it did do is it taught me that if you're going to be into something, trust your gut. Especially when you're the one, if it fails, your name's going to be at the top of the yeah. ledger. And if the one, if it's successful, you're going to get all the credit. So either way, you can feel good about it. If I know I did my best and trusted my gut and it failed, I can live with that. And that's one thing that bothers me, one regret, that I didn't trust myself. It didn't work. And I'm mad because I always will second guess how it would have gone had I trusted my gut. And um, and then when you get credit, if something does work and you were a big part of it, you don't feel guilty for taking credit someone else deserves. And and so I'm all in and we've always been all in everything that we've and done. We, and we're like that with all of our partners, whether it's his lines or Snoop and Shantae's lines, like Aaron's line, everybody's hands on. And I think some of our partners still have a hard time getting used to that, but it's for exactly what he just said. It's their name on the packaging. And they're not going to say, oh, it was Constance's failure. It's going to be their failure. We got our marketing department here, and you just <laughs> turn it over to us. No. Nah, never. We, we no. know how that story yeah. ends. Because I'm not in the business of asking for forgiveness. Yes. Like I, you know, I, not on this. Well, guys, um, you know, before I let you go, I obviously – I love you, and I love what you. you've built. Um, and I know early in the interview, I said I wasn't going to make it about you, but I'm going to end with something about you. Because the one thing that I've noticed and has totally been cemented in this conversation, and I try to instill in this in my kids, is you live the shit out of life. And I think that is, like, incredible. You tried that show for a year. You went to space. You played football. You were tired before anyone else wanted you to. And obviously, you've dealt with shit. Everyone deals with shit. But you show up. Like, you always show up, and there's a level of comfort that I think is your biggest gift that you give people when they watch you and they're around you. And it's a special thing. And, and that's, you know, a fortunate thing to have a partner like this. But the fuel that you give everything, I'm sure, is, you would say, the battery in, like, the back of everybody. And it's a pretty amazing amazing gift you have thank you no i appreciate that and what are you laughing at huh she's laughing over there she's laughing as at long as the honest. public sees that that's what counts no you know what no what are you talking about you know my thing is this though and this is very true people always say how do you do so much and i just kind of wake up and go i don't even think about it because i enjoy everything that i do 
And if I don't, then I probably won't do it. Yeah. But I will try everything. I'll try something once. Then I go, yeah, I won't do that anymore. And I just won't do it. But I don't know, man. I don't know how to half-ass anything. Like, if I'm there, I'm there. You're maximizing. Yeah, I wanted to quit. One for my, I didn't play football in high school one year. And I go to TSU. I wanted to quit. And then my dad made me go back to school, thank God. But at that moment, like, something clicked in my mind that, you know what? I can't go back home. I got to be here. Uh, I have to play football. I have to go to school. So why just be like everyone else who just goes through the motion just to get through it? You're going to be here. Do the best you can at it and see what happens. And be just, and it doesn't take that much more effort to be better. And, you know, but if you're trying to be better every day, it compounds to where the separation between you and everyone else is 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 probably too much to overcome by for most people but yeah i i live every day man i i love experiences i try everything i have fun and i just try to have people's backs well guys thank you for showing up for me today thank you for telling your story thank i you can't wait to work with the two of you guys in the future thanks for tuning in thanks for listening thanks for watching go to boardroom.tv and we'll see you all soon peace, peace.